They say that if we lose one of our senses, our sight, our sense of taste, our sense of hearing, then all of the other senses become heightened to compensate for the fact. Well, what would you do if you lost your sense of feeling? Not something any of us ever really think about, is it? Well, tonight's story addresses just such an issue, and you will be amazed by how it pans out, I can tell you. Now, this is another story by a writer I've just discovered, Chris Bird 93 and it is a brilliant one. So, my dear friends, I think you know what to do. Just in case, I'm going to tell you again. <laughs> it's time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. We'd been together for nearly three years, and I think I can speak for both of us when I say neither of us had ever been happier. We did everything together. We lived together, we worked together, albeit in different departments, and we rarely spent a day apart. Emma often woke up in the middle of the night. She wasn't like me, in the way that I could always sleep through the thunderstorms or the rattling of the trains whizzing past the back of our flat at consistent hourly intervals. She'd often tell me about what she'd heard throughout the night. Whether it was my sleep talking, or our neighbours having another argument at three in the morning as the husband once again stumbled home drunk, there was always something that had happened. My deep sleep had bothered her slightly, Simply because, well, I'd fall asleep first, and she'd be left struggling to close her eyes alone. On many nights she'd find herself squashed up against the wall, because I'd slowly shuffled my way across to her side of the bed. We could never swap sides, however, because we'd both agreed that I would be on the side closest to the door. A month or so ago, as usual, Emma woke up to the train that passed us at 1.50am. She turned in the bed switching onto her right side to face me. I was sound asleep, of course. This was when it first happened. She twisted her body around from the wall, but couldn't feel the sheets upon her skin, or her body against the mattress. She lifted her hands towards her face and rubbed her eyes. Nothing. Alex, she whimpered. Alex! She gently pushed my shoulder. I murmured a still sleeping reply, but then one hard shove brought me back to the real world. When I opened my eyes, Emma was digging her nails into her face. I can't feel anything, she cried, tears beginning to well in her eyes. Seeing her like this, I sat up immediately, my heart rate increasing tenfold. Hey! Hey, hey, it's all right, I soothed, taking her into my arms so that her forehead rested on my chest. Her face was embedded with several red half-moons from her nails. It must have been a bad dream, that's all. No, she wept. I can't feel you touching me. I can't feel anything right now. When she said that, it sent shivers down my spine. I lifted her head so she was looking at me, and she rubbed her eyes with her palm to such force that I felt sick. I can't feel anything, she repeated. It was horrible seeing her like this. I grabbed her hands and pinned them down to her sides with a stern look and a heavy breath. Okay, let me see, I said, softly but firmly. I pushed the covers off from us as tears began to roll down her cheeks and drip onto the pillow. Her hands began to scratch at the top of her knuckles, leaving long red lines leading to her wrists. Stop, babe, I ordered, motioning to her hands. She whimpered again, but paused the scratching and sat on her palms. Can you feel this? I asked, running my fingernail along the base of her foot. A word didn't manage to escape her lips. She just shook her head and let out a little cry. My hand worked my way up her leg, across her hips, her torso, her neck. 
I pinched her gently. I pinched her hard. She truly didn't feel anything. My mind was spinning through all of our options. But I sidled up next to her in bed and kissed her lips. She didn't kiss back. I guided her downstairs and drove her to A&E. Once we arrived, we waited in near silence until someone was ready to see us. Eventually, the two of us followed a nurse into an examination room, and the sterile smell married with the white walls and large tile-like lights above us. Emma sat in the chair, and we waited a few moments more for the doctor to arrive. Once he joined us, Emma explained the condition that had overcome her but the doctor was utterly bewildered. This condition is something I've only heard about, he admitted. It's extremely rare, and moreover, it's only ever been genetic. Emma was scratching at her wrists again, so I tried to hold her hand. She didn't even know until I made her look. The doctor kept her in overnight, and I stayed by her bed. She did actually manage to fall asleep, however, and I think it's because she exhausted herself with worry. I, on the other hand, couldn't bear to close my eyes. I watched her sleep until she woke up the following morning. She woke and took a minute to get her bearings, as the memories flooded back into her mind from the previous night. She patted her body with her hand, then again, and again, and again. <laughs> I can feel, she said, ecstatic. Then tears came, but happy tears. We cuddled and kissed, and she was discharged after a few tests. We were both given the day off work. I'd called the night porters once she'd fallen asleep and informed them of the situation. So, we spent the day at home watching terrible reality TV and cookery shows. We were completely back to normal. A simple blip in our pretty, perfect lives. That night, the 1.50am train shook past the flat and jolted Emma awake. She scratched her body all over, unable to feel pain, and then woke me up. I comforted her as she cried, truly terrified she'd be living like this for the rest of her life. We both fell asleep at home, as the doctor had told us there was no medication to help. We were both at work the following morning, tired but relieved. It seemed to only be a nighttime ailment, and something that could be overcome with a little time. I made her promise to wake me up whenever she couldn't feel pain. And for a week, that was our lives. She would wake up and then wake me up. We got into the habit of watching YouTube to pass the time, and I made sure that she always fell asleep first. Last Friday, Emma didn't wake me up. When I opened my eyes in the morning, I cuddled up to her until she awoke. She bolted upright. Long scratch marks that had bled overnight and healed over covered her forearms. What did you do? I asked, trying to hide how scared it had made me. She was starting to cry again. When I woke up, I didn't feel scared. Well, that's good, I said, relaxing a little. No, you don't understand, she muttered. I didn't feel anything, but not only physically, emotionally too. I squinted slightly out of confusion and felt creases appear on my forehead. I wasn't scared, she repeated. She looked at me and she began to cry even more. But what scares me the most now, she whimpered, is that I didn't even love you. I just didn't care. I had no emotion in me at all, and I just couldn't be bothered to wake you up. I felt my heart tear a little inside, but I understood the situation. That wasn't the real Emma. 
I smiled and soothed her. Well, you love me now, right? Of course, she cried, falling into my arms. She cried heavily, sobbing against my chest as I stroked her hair. I hushed her and told her it would all be okay. We spent the day at home and ordered pizza for dinner. We pretty much went back to normality. But I couldn't stop staring at her wrists. I set an alarm for 2 a.m. My alarm is pretty gentle. One of those that slowly gets louder with each recurring cycle. When it finally pulled me from my sleep, I turned to find Emma was nowhere to be found. I cautiously made my way out of our room and toward the kitchen. I found Emma naked and facing away from me, staring out of the window and painted in a layer of tea from the streetlight outside. A long kitchen knife was in her right hand, and blood was dripping from the tip into a small pool beneath her. Em, I quietly called. I can't feel anything. She said, lifelessly. She slowly turned around to face me. Her face was placid, despite two long cuts on both sides from cheekbone to chin. Blood was dripping down her neck. Her top half was a mix of slashes and stabs. Oh, Emma, I stuttered, fumbling towards her. Come near me and I'll kill you. She warned. There was no aggressiveness in her voice. It was a total matter-of-fact statement. I exhaled a hopeless breath and begged her to please let me help. But she pointed the knife at me. You don't understand, she said. It's all relative. I'm not afraid to die anymore. I'm free. I have nothing to hold me to this world. I'm not sad or happy, or scared or brave. I just see it how it is now. I'm calling an ambulance, I stated. Whatever. Just stay away from me. I called the ambulance and gave them our information. And they told me to stay on the phone. I dropped it when Emma plunged the knife into her ribcage. Without thinking, I ran over and grabbed her hands. But I said not to come over, she said, fighting against my hands. The knife jarringly retracted and reinserted into her stomach a few times. Eventually, it fully exited with her hands on the handle and my hands around her wrist. With enormous effort, I managed to prise apart her fingers. I took her to the floor and locked her arms behind her back until the paramedics arrived. They tied her down during the journey to the hospital, and she seemed completely unbothered by it all. I was by her side when the sun rose from behind the horizon. I was by her side when she woke up. I was by her side when she looked at me and said, I still don't feel anything. Emma was submitted to a psychiatric hospital last week, not too far from our flat. My life just isn't the same without her. I just can't live like this. The worst part of it all, however, is that when I go visit her, and she sits across from me in her straitjacket, every now and again, the real Emma comes out, and she cries, and she asks me to help her. And she tells me that she is so scared. So, another phenomenal story there from the amazing Chris Bird 93 I can guarantee I will be doing a lot more stories from this writer on the channel in the very near future. Well, what do you think? Amazing story, wasn't it? Didn't see that coming at all. Well, let me know what you think in the comments section below, and as always, I'll do my best to answer as many as I can. 
Oh, my dear friends, it's Friday night. Haven't you got anything better to do than listen to me? Well, if not, I'm glad I was able to bring you a little bit of uh, happiness to your evening. <laughs> now, you have a good weekend. I'll see you all again on Monday. And that's all for me for now. Well, apart from another little story that I've got lined up for you. So, bye-bye, but stay tuned, okay? <laughs>
Of course, this meant that they had to post up near the hospital they told the media about. Otherwise, they would catch on to their duplicity. Their ploy had worked, and there was no one in sight. The girl would be allowed to convalesce in peace, without media buzzing around her like flies in a shit heap. Christine arrived and was taken up to the OR wing of the hospital. This wasn't because she needed surgery, but because the OR was shut down on the weekends. I always assumed it was closed because the surgeons wanted some time to play around with 18 holes on the weekend without having to worry about checking in on their wards. <laughs> she was brought into the OR because there weren't a whole lot of people there and it would be easier to keep all non-essential personnel out of the way. There was a flurry of doctors around her and I couldn't really get a good look at her through the whirlwind of white coats and nurses' scrubs. But I did catch glimpses. She had dirty brown hair that looked like it was a bird's nest and hadn't been combed in a long time. There were scars along her arms and legs that I am fairly certain didn't stop at the sleeves of her clothes. Her right hand was shattered and it looked like it had been shoved into an industrial trash compactor. Bones poked out of her hand like pins in a pincushion. She was emaciated and looked like she'd been through hell. The doctors took a blood sample and left to run some tests and a few other scans. The nurses pulled the curtain and helped her change into some scrubs. When they pulled the curtain back, I saw that the scars indeed did not stop at her sleeves. The nurses asked some basic questions and then went on their way to treat their other patients. The only information I caught was that she was 14. She didn't know if she had any allergies and she had been held captive in the woods for over three years. Once the nurses left, it was just me and Christine in the hospital room. I had no clue of what to say to her. She was obviously shell-shocked. I'm not really a conversationalist, so I try to keep my trap shut and not look at her injuries. Hmm, I didn't do a good enough job, because she caught me looking at her hand. She raised her broken right hand and said, That hurt like a bitch. She gasped and raised her hand to her mouth, as if she'd said something horrible. And I tried to put on my best smile and told her that it was all right if she wanted to swear. She paused and then said, uncertainly, Fuck, shit, balls. She spoke like she was testing them out and enjoyed how they rolled off her tongue. She continued by telling me that he wouldn't let her swear. Now, it was here that I breached protocol and asked her about what had happened out there in the woods. I wanted to have that information ready for the police when they arrived, so maybe I could save her the trouble of rehashing it for two stone-faced officers. Well, I remember a time they asked a rape victim to describe her attacker's genitals who then broke down at being forced to remember that trauma. I tried to give her that one mercy and protect her after she'd been exposed to so much. So, I was trying to give her that one mercy and protect her after she'd been exposed to so much. She looked down and said, The hand doesn't hurt as much as you'd think. I think it's the fact that I had to steal myself for what I had to do. I needed that hand broken so I could slip the cuffs. I had to do it otherwise he would take it from me again. Do you understand? The kid smashed her own hand up. She did it so she could slip the cuffs off. I then asked her the question that I wish I'd never asked. I asked her 
what her captor was going to take from her. Thinking maybe he'd given her a puppy or a doll to assert control over her. Christine lowered her hand to her stomach. And, for a second, I thought she was having some intestinal issues until she said, I'm late. The horror of that statement barely had time to sink in before she continued. She said that she'd missed her period before, and when her captor found out, he beat her viciously. She told me that he kept striking her until she was on the ground, and then he kicked her in the stomach. She started to cry, and there wasn't a single thing I could think of to say to calm her down other than, it's over. Around this time, a nurse arrived and gave Christine a sedative. I think they did this so they could examine the extent of her injuries without causing her any more pain or the trauma of reliving it. I hate to say it, but I was thankful she was out cold. I didn't want to hear any more about the horrors she'd had to endure for those three years. The scars and the improperly healed bones were a testament to the tortures she'd suffered. I watched over her for a few hours. I tried not to look too closely at the hundreds of scars. Some calloused and healed, while others looked like they were weeks old. The soles of her feet were blackened and cut up from running through the woods for miles while seeking help. I tried not to look at her mangled right hand that she had stomped and broken so she could slip the cuffs off. I tried not to look. It was around five o'clock when the man showed up in the OR. I was getting ready to kick him out when he asked if I was watching over Christine Parker. He was an average looking guy. He was wearing jeans and had a weary look about him. I told him I was watching over a private patient whose identity had not been known to me, just like the guide tells us to say. I thought he was some vulture from the newspaper who'd slipped in, but that's when he told me that he was her father, Richard Parker. He kept pressing, and eventually I relented under the condition that I stay in the room while he was there. I brought him into the room and he stood over the broken body of his girl. It looked like he was about to break into tears at the sight of her injuries, but he managed to keep himself under control. As she was unconscious, there wasn't much he could do or say to her. He stroked the side of her face and then sat down next to me. We sat in silence for five minutes before he struck up a conversation with me. He told me all about his daughter, how she liked those frilly Disney princesses. How she used to be so afraid of the dark that he'd had to buy a nightlight. How he used to carry her around on his shoulders. <sighs> it was here that he really cried. He buried his face in his hands and wept. He looked like a man who was weeping at a funeral. Which, in a sense, I guess he was. The daughter he knew had died. She would live a scarred and emotionally damaged life. He took a couple of minutes to get himself under control. He told me that his wife would be here shortly. We talked a little more. It was mainly small talk. I can't even remember what we talked about exactly. He was more focused on Christine than talking. But I think he felt uncomfortable with the silence. Now, I don't have an exact time, but I think we probably dragged the conversation on for an hour or so. It was around 7.30 when Christine started to come to from the sedative. Richard Parker noticed her stirring and rushed to her side. He stroked the side of her face as she opened her eyes. He leaned down and planted a kiss on her forehead and whispered something into her ear. He turned towards me and told me that he'd promised he'd let his wife know when she was awake. 
He left for the main lobby just as my radio went off in my ear. It was my boss radioing in so he could take over my shift. I went down to the command post and greeted my boss. He typically showed up 15 minutes early to let me off with a couple of extra minutes. He asked how it went, and I told him that it had been pretty quiet, except for when the father visited. A look of confusion crossed his face, and he told me that Christopher and Regina Parker were supposed to be coming in at around noon, so the doctors and nurses could bandage and treat her before the reunion. The realization hit me like a foot stomping onto a hand. I sprinted back towards the OR. I sprinted down the hallway, dodging nurses and doctors alike. Christine was bone white, and the look in her eyes confirmed my worst fears. She sat frozen on the bed. She looked like she'd seen the devil himself, and, to her eyes, she probably had. I was out of breath from running, but I managed to wheeze out. Who was that? She spoke in a whisper, but it felt like she was shouting the words right into my ears. It was him. I croaked. What did he tell you? She looked up at me, and in that moment her eyes were as wide as saucers. She said, He told me that he loved the time we'd spent together, and that we should do it again. The rest of the words caught in her throat, and she broke down wailing and weeping. My boss arrived at around that time, and I was fired almost on the spot. That's my story. <laughs> I know I messed up, but how could I have known who that guy was? Well, now that I say it all out loud, I guess I really was in the wrong on this. I doubt I'm going to get a termination package. The trip out here was a waste of time. Well, not completely. Maybe I'll go give Christine a visit. Hey, why are you looking at me like that? What's going on here? This, oh, this whole interview wasn't about my severance or wrongful termination. This interview was about Christine. Oh God, is she all right? Christine has been missing since last night. We have no clue where she could be. Hey there. Thank you so much for taking the time to drop by and listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me. I put a lot of time and effort into making these videos, so it's nice to know that there's someone out there listening. Do me a little favor, would you? Click that like button, leave a comment, and if you really feel like it, why not subscribe too? Okay, happy tales everyone. See you soon.